Uh, hello, uh, my name is Nigel Topping. I am the UN High Level Climate Action Champion for COP26. Um, that's a, it's a role that was created as part of the Paris Agreement to work with everyone who's not a national government, so with local governments and the private sector in particular, to drive action and ambition on climate change in support of the implementation of the Paris Agreement to get to a resilient zero carbon world in the 2040s. We're all part of society and every single one of us individually and every single organisation in society has a role. This is a, this is a fundamental transition that we're going through and it will take all of us. Um, one of my favourite examples is that there's a, a schools initiative called Let's Get to Zero, over 500 schools working to get to net zero by 2030. There's hundreds of universities in the race to zero and of course every community group can, depending on what their own focus is, they can play their own part in taking action towards zero and they and they can become conduits for educating the community for um, making sure that people know what is possible there's some very bad news here about how bad the science is and how late we've been but there's some very good news about the solutions being available um, and us knowing what we have to do but it's going to take all of us to have the will to win the race to zero as we call it Welcome everyone to our Cornwall and also silly Let's Talk Climate Action event. I'd like to welcome everyone from both Cornwall and the people joining us from the Isles of Scilly. As a region, collectively, we are experiencing and seeing the impact of climate change in a number of ways through our coastal erosion, flooding and extreme weather incidents. And whilst be between mainland Cornwall and the islands, we may have some slight these separate issues in relation to climate change, we do share some common issues and many of the solutions. We farm and grew, grow food for ourselves and the rest of the UK, and we all have to get around and heat and power our homes. And we are sharing our knowledge and experience working together on delivering low carbon and carbon sequestration solutions for our own areas and the rest of the country. Our event is an official COP26 regional roadshow event. So we are part of COP26 right here in Cornwall and on the Sillies. We're going to share a message from Alex Sharma, the president of COP26 now. Hello, I'm Alex Sharma, president designate of COP26. Uh, COP26 is the critical United Nations climate change conference that we are holding in Glasgow in November, where almost 200 countries will come together for one of the most important climate conferences for years. And the reason it is so important is simple. Time is running out to address the impacts of climate change. In 2015, the world signed the Paris Agreement, an international deal to tackle the threat of climate change. And world leaders committed to do all they could to limit global temperature rises to well below two degrees and closer to 1.5 degrees because the science shows that this would avoid the very worst effects of climate change. But to keep that 1.5 limit within reach, we must halve global emissions by 2030. And that means taking action now. Now, the good news is that there is no choice to be made between protecting the planet and thriving economies. Here in the United Kingdom, for example, over the last 30 years, we have grown our economy by 78% whilst cutting emissions by 44%. And across the country, we aim for the economy to support 2 million green jobs over the next 10 years. At COP26, we want to put the world on a path to driving down emissions until they reach net zero by the middle of the century. And that's essential to keeping the 1.5 degree limit alive. We also want to take action to protect people and nature from the effects of climate change like storms and droughts, to get public and private finance flowing to climate action, and to work together to make the negotiations in Glasgow a success. We all have a role to play in tackling the climate crisis. It is the combined efforts of cities, regions, businesses, communities across the UK, and indeed across the world, that will make our clean, green future a reality. So I urge you, to explore what your area, your community can do. And together and beyond, let's make 2021 the year we get the world on track to 
protect our precious planet. Thank you. I'm grateful to Alec for making the time to record that message for us. I'm sure he's very busy. I'm joined today by Kate Canally, Chief Executive, Cornwall Council, and colleagues from the Isles of Scilly. Paul Masters, Chief Executive of the Council of the Isles of Scilly, and Councillor Steve Watt, the lead member for Environment, Environmental Services and Climate Change. We're now going to hear from Councillor Steve Watt. Both councils have recognised the importance of this global issue and how it will impact our communities. Both councils declared a climate emergency in early 2019 to reaffirm our concerns and push for solutions to the challenges we all face. We aim to be net carbon zero by 2030, and this ambition has been embedded in local plans and corporate plans. But I think it's important to realize that councils cannot do this alone. And we need a community to respond by revolutionizing the ways to tackle climate emergency through pr practical plans of action. As a council, what we can do, though, is to set the pace and establish good practice. So this is a call to arms, in effect, to the community. It's to encourage local conversations to help us all focus on what we can control and influence to achieve our ambition to achieve zero carbon by 2030 and to protect Cornwall and Scilly for future generations. Thank you, Steve. Kate and Paul will be listening in on the theme sessions and will be joining Steve and I in the last se sessions of the day when we look at the next steps and taking climate action forward in our lives, businesses and activities. This is a Team Cornwall event, and we have some great guest speakers taking part in the theme talks, which I'm really looking forward to hearing. And I know Kate, Paul and Steve are too. As Cornwall hosted the G7 Summit back in the summer, I'm so proud to be hosting this COP26 regional event as the United Nations are gathered in Glasgow to discuss how we can take action together for our planet. This is absolutely the right time for Cornwall to be looking to our 2030 goal for reaching net zero carbon and making that a reality through action and achieving results. Our local COP showpiece event and you today are part of a great movement that is happening right across the UK. And there are some other wonderful activities happening here in Cornwall as well. As part of the G7 Kurnow Cultural Legacy Programme, Artists' voices from Cornwall are being portrayed through photography and film, expressing what millions of people feel to send a strong climate emergency message to COP26 in Glasgow. And 110 school children from Cornwall are performing in the Royal Albert Hall, singing Coldplay's song, I Will Fix You, to celebrate how people in Cornwall are making a difference for our climate and our community. And just as the G7 summit inspired a generation to show how they care for our environment, I want our event today to inspire more people to get involved and to make a difference for Cornwall and our planet. There is so much happening and Cornwall has already got several big successes under our low carbon belt. And now we must carry that momentum forwards to build on those accomplishments to achieve more. We are going to hear later today about some great projects and people that are leading the way in low carbon action and setting a great example to us all. Which brings me to our keynote speaker. I'm really excited that Monty Halls is able to join us today. Monty has a great affiliation with Cornwall. He hails from Plymouth, which we can forgive, and he, and he and his family were living in Cornwall when his daughter was born. So he has a Cornish child. I came across Monty when watching his BBC series, The Fisherman's Apprentice, was taken by how much he cares about the environment. And it came across so strongly that Monty feels very passionately that our environment is precious and we must take care of it now. 
as we begin to experience the very real impacts of climate change. So let's hear from Monty now. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Monty Halls and hello from across the border, across the border in Devon. Um, I'm speaking to you from the office here in Totnes, but um, I must say my heart is in Cornwall, Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. And uh, indeed my DNA is, my, my daughter was born in, in Cadgwith, um, where I was working on a project as a, as a fisherman there, a small boat fisherman. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak at what is a seminal time you know, a seminal moment. I've called the presentation a moment in time, which is probably a slightly histrionic title, but unequivocally, um, we are at that crunch point. Um, you know, I think that's beyond doubt. And that's been the very strong message from, from COP, of course. This is an uncompromising moment in our species. There's, there's no doubt about that. Now, I'm keenly aware that Cornwall is kind of at the vanguard, actually, of uh, a, a lot of the change and implementing uh, authentic programs and engineering genuine change within the county to be ahead of the game in terms of addressing these issues. So um, all I'm going to talk about really is the sort of wider world and um, why all this is so, so significant. And also, I think what a key role we can all play in the process. Now, I've been told two things on pain of death. I'm not allowed to go over 20 minutes. And the other one is I have to mention the Isles of Scilly. So uh, the Isles of Scilly, I did a wonderful program uh, out there, as in diving uh, archaeology thing. And the island stayed with me forever, as, as they do, I think, with anyone who, who goes out there. So um, uh, we're all islanders. And um, as I've often said, the, um, everyone in Britain's an islander. You're never more than 70 miles away from the sea. But um, some are more islanders than other, and I think uh, in the Sillies that certainly applies. So, uh, okay, moving on. As uh, as I said, I've got quite a, a strong connection with uh, Cornwall. I, I I grew up in Padstow, and um, I obviously worked on the Fisherman's Apprentice program in Cadgwith, which was a fascinating glimpse into the wider and very complex issues of conservation and doing the right thing in terms of the uh, environment. Um, but uh, in, in terms of that, I mentioned that we have a very clear role at the moment, our generation. And I firmly believe that. And the reason is we've had unfettered access to the facilities. Um, our, our generation in particular, you know, we've explored the oceans. We've um, traveled the world uh, both on land and in the sea as tourists. And we have visited places that previously have only been the preserve of, of scientists and explorers. And I, I think we've been extraordinarily lucky uh, with that. We've enjoyed unfettered travel. We've enjoyed unfettered access to uh, a world that certainly over the course of our lifetime has, has undergone dramatic change. And now we hand that world on to the next generation. And, and with that comes huge responsibility, I think, for our generation. There's a, a wonderful quote from a scientist called Jay Varon who wrote a great book called A Reef in Time about the Great Barrier Reef. And he said, we are the most fortunate generation that has ever lived or ever will live. And um, I agree with that. You know, we haven't experienced a, a global conflict and certainly until the pandemic, which obviously affected all of us as global citizens, we hadn't really experienced a tectonic event that, uh, that will affect all of us moving forward until climate change. And uh, we are in that moment now. And I, I think uh, to consider our position and our responsibilities and our role moving forward is absolutely essential at this juncture. And there's um, a wonderful expression. It's a Maori expression that says, be good ancestors, plant trees you will never see. And I think that us setting an example to the next generation coming through and saying we as the decision makers, we as the people who are, are, are in charge of so many of the things that are going to directly impact the world you live in, we are making change and we are doing things. We are setting an example and empowering you to, to actually make those changes as well. We want to work with you. We want to be good ancestors. And I think that's so, so important right now. It's got to happen right now. Now, and in terms of change, by the way, when we were chatting about uh, the lecture and, um, you know, the talk and really what it should be about, I mentioned that 
I struggle as much as anyone else does. How do you implement change? How do you do things on a personal level or on a smaller scale? And there are many, many ways you can do that. And I think to be a good ancestor, for the next generation to look back and say, yeah, they really made a difference. They, they helped us in uh, engineering the change that we're seeing at the moment. It means we face a simple decision. We either do something or we do nothing. It's binary. And it's up to us. We either do something or nothing. And that could be a small thing. And what I did was get my team together. Here, this is the office, uh, the, you know, the production company I run. Got them all together and said, what can we do? You know, what can we do as a group to actually create a bit of change to work in a more environmentally friendly way? And it was amazing, the suggestions that came out, many of which we implemented. So, like I said, all those little things, they do make a huge difference. Now, just touching briefly on working as a, as a Cornish fisherman. Um, it was an extraordinary experience, you know, tall, posh bloke called Monty going down to a very traditional uh, Cornish village to try and work as a, uh, as a fisherman. It's the hardest work I've ever done in my life. And um, I speak as an ex-Royal Marine, former physical training instructor in the Marines. There was nothing like physical graft like this physical graft. And the thing that dawned on me very quickly was the complexity of the issues surrounding fishing, surrounding sustainability in the ocean. And that's something we, uh, again, we must avoid and we need to educate the next generation about to say these are not simple issues because sometimes those binary solutions can be really attractive to say, well, uh, Seaspiracy on Netflix uh, recently came out with a simple solution. We all stop eating fish. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. And it's a, a slightly arrogant kind of Western world uh, approach. These are nuanced, complex arguments. And part of our responsibility, I think, is presenting those arguments to the, to the next generation and educating and say, this is potentially a way we can move forward here. I spent most of my time working on the, the small boats. 80% of the fishing boats in the UK are under 10 meters long, and they catch 8% of the fish. Uh, so the remaining 20% of boats, the larger boats, catch 92% um, of the fish. But these small communities, these small boats sustainably fishing are so, so important. And uh, the other thing I discovered, by the way, randomly, is every fisherman in the UK is five foot eight. They're all five foot eight. Um, I was this great lanky thing on a boat, eternally bashing my head, something to do with sort of genetic engineering at sea uh, or something. Um, it's also extremely tough work. A fisherman's got a one in 20 chance of being killed during the course of his working life. And, um, so for me, it gave me a glimpse of another world. I came into this as a, um, as a marine biologist, as a conservationist, thinking, you know, fishing fleets bad, conservation good. And of course, as I said, it's so much more complicated than that. It's not all trawl gear, static gear, pots, things like this. Um, and sustainable fishing is, is possible. And I think there's a danger of demonizing um, an awful lot of organizations and companies that we consider on the wrong side of the environmental divide. And I think it's a very, very dangerous thing to do. It was a real education for me. And uh, I was really welcomed into this community because they wanted to tell their story. This was my boat on day one, by the way. The other skippers made their, made their feelings known about this, this lad coming in. But um, the thing that um, is so crucial is always remembering the human element of every environmental change we're trying to make. And as we all know, our fishing fleets in, in Cornwall, they go back thousands of years. They're, they're the last tribe we have in the, in the UK, the last people that hunt wild food for our consumption. They have their own culture, they have their own ethos, and they have their own way of, of, of going about their, their business. An entire, um, for every one fisherman at sea, there's four jobs ashore. And entire communities have grown up, of course, around that culture. And um, I think the point I'm trying to make here is th this is not simple. It's not a simple case of, okay, we stop doing this. It's doing it in an intelligent way. And as I said, communicating that to the next generation, I think, is absolutely key. Um, so um, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, all this. And I think we're all aware. We all feel like that at times, you know, when you see the, the plastics in the ocean, when you see the disappearance of iconic 
species around the world, when you see um, harrowing images, and this is in the Galapagos Islands when I was working out there, a Chinese fishing boat came right through the middle of the islands, a World Heritage Site, and just swept up shark species as it, as it came through. You see things like this, and sometimes it can be overwhelming. But I think there is a real cause for hope and a cause for optimism. I think there's genuine dialogue going on at the moment and, uh, with COP. You know, we'll see whether that's actually implemented. But for example, in the Galapagos, the president of Ecuador has just increased the marine reserve around the islands by 60,000 square kilometers. These are big, big gestures that are being made. And we'll see how that uh, transpires over the next few years. The reason it's important is we have a generation of young people coming through who are more empowered, more engaged, communicating on a mass scale, and are saying, we're going to do something about this. We believe that we can sort this out. And as I know, I've mentioned it several times, our role as mentors, our role as teachers, our role as engineers, our role as leaders for these young people has never been more important to say to them, you're right, you're right. And we're going to help you in that process. I think there can be a bit of a inertia, sometimes demonize some of these arguments and treat them as noisy rabble rousers. And actually, you know, what we need to do is enable them. And as I said, be those, those great ancestors. And I saw that transformation of, uh, you know, introducing a, a young person to an environment. When I took my own little girls, my Cornish lasses, um, to uh, the Galapagos uh, Islands and saw this incredible effect of um, introducing them to wild spaces and working with them and educating them and saying, yeah, this is what it's all, all about, these curious young minds. And there's a, a great expression, it's by Roald Dahl, and says, above all, watch with glittering eyes the whole world around you because the greatest secrets are always hidden in the most unlikely places. Those who don't believe in magic will never find it. And the one thing I found consistently working with young people and working around the world is they believe in magic. They believe that they can make these transformations. And uh, as I said, it's so important that we inspire and we lead um, right now to, to help them in that uh, process because they are watching us unequivocally. Uh, they are watching us, that, that next generation. I love this photo, by the way. Have you ever seen a more Cornish looking uh, flame haired Celtic maid uh, than that particular, uh, that particular photo? Great thing, by the way, is um, just, this is purely subjective, is I've noticed around the world is the rise of a lot of young female scientists. And uh, this is working on a shark project and um, so loads of young female scientists. It sort of strikes me as one of the reasons maybe suddenly things are getting done. And there's a wonderful poem that I recite to my two little daughters uh, that says, never be a princess when you can be a queen. Swing the scepter, wear the crown, dominate the scene. Don't wear crystal slippers, they'll shatter on your feet. Be happy in your own skin and then you'll be complete. Be a barefoot Amazon, be young, be wild, be free and never grow a wishbone daughter where your backbone ought to be. And uh, it's wonderful to see the growth of, of these young people gripping these issues. And one of the best examples of that I ever came across was on the west coast of Australia, of showing that this stuff works. If we get stuck in, if we get engaged, if we inspire communities, if we enable people to do things, they engineer genuine change. And this was um, working with whale sharks, young whale shark scientists. There you go, uh, young female whale, uh, whale shark. They were the uh, scientists on the left there, those two girls. And uh, whale sharks and manta rays uh, as well. That's what we were studying out there. And um, such was the uh, relationship between the scientists and the animals. This is the oldest, by the way, human continuous civilization in the world, in this part of the world. The Aboriginal culture there, 60,000 years, continuous years of respecting the environment and respecting the animals. And that's just really been handed on to the next generation of scientists and, and Westerners who, who work out there. And uh, while we were there, we um, came across this animal here, which was a, a manta ray. And plainly, the manta ray was in distress. There was something wrong with it. And it approached us just to show that it can work, this stuff, that if we do uh, interact with the environment, and the animals therein in a positive way, it can reap wonderful rewards. And again and again, this young, this animal came up, this manta ray, um, and because uh, it, it knew the guides and it knew the scientists and it knew it was in safe hands. And suddenly it became apparent 
The reason was it had fish hooks embedded under its eye. This is a completely wild animal. Weighs a ton and a half, can swim at 21 knots, could have disappeared at any point. And it came to our young scientists for help. And it was the wonderful uh, sort of uh, affirmation of what can happen when you get this sort of thing right. And this is the little video of what happened next. Get closer and closer. And then she started to roll over and present. You could see she was trusting us because she was unrolling it and showing us the hook. I went for a few dives down just to see how she'd react to us being close to her. And Jake uh, went down again and again and again, and the animal didn't move away because I think the manta knew that Jake was trying to get the hooks out. down again just one last time just to you know, say goodbye and she actually stopped and just waited there. She understands what's just happened. Again and again, attempt after attempt, it was brilliant. That's one of the best things I've ever seen underwater. There we are, lovely. Now, um, I talk about this moment thing and um, I think um, there's a great sort of groundswell in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly about addressing these issues and I, and I wonder if it's because you have such a close relationship you know that Cornwall's 80 percent coastline you know you are so mired you're marinated in the environment around you and always have been you know Cornwall is the veranda of of Europe one of the few places you can stand with your heels on a great continent and, and your toes in a mighty ocean. And I wonder if that has uh, initiated so much of the change that, that you are creating uh, at the moment, the positive change. And um, I worked for Nelson Mandela after he was released from uh, prison. And um, he showed that one person can make a huge difference. Setting an example can make a huge difference. And obviously an exceptional uh, example there, but it was the actions of of one person really saying, yeah, I'm today is the day that I decide how we move forward. And this is a great Hemingway quote. Today is only one day in all the days that will ever be, but what will happen in all the other days that ever come can depend on what you do today. And I think today is that day for all of us, uh, really, in terms of engineering that change. And just to show that this stuff does work, my really strong connections with the Galapagos Islands now, president of the Galapagos Conservation Trust, and obviously heavily involved in the work that's going on out there. At the bottom of that uh, image of that map, you'll see a little island called Floriana. Floriana, uh, Floriana was ruined by, by the presence of man. First island to be colonized in 1831, and it was absolutely ravaged. And the local people in the last five years have said, no, we are gonna make a difference. We are gonna change our interaction with the world around us, and we're gonna save our island. And they've done it through initiatives. There, there's a huge rewilding initiative that the whole world is watching at the moment about can we turn the clock back environmentally on that island? And it's been driven by local people and really wonderful, inspiring individuals who've got together and said, right, we are going to engineer change ourselves and we're going to make it happen. It's wonderful to see that process. Galapagos has always been the laboratory of the world. It's always been the place where... Obviously, it's the origin of evolutionary theory. It's where Charles Darwin came up with the idea of evolutionary theory and, and all that. So it's wonderful to see there of all places that this stuff works. It really does work. And uh, there's a, um, a, I think uh, for all of us, you know, with, in terms of um, our proximity to the environment, particularly down here in the Southwest, you know, it's really heartening to hear about uh, examples like that. Uh, I think, and, uh, to appreciate what we have here in terms of our own coastline, our own environment, and the changes we're actually making that are having a positive impact, not just on that environment, but also on the generation coming through. And I think sometimes it can be hard. Um, a lot of the time it's really hard and you have your head in your hands and you think, I'm not making a difference. Uh, you are. You absolutely Ah, and there's a wonderful quote from Margaret Mead, who's a, a famous conservationist, said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has.
And I firmly believe that. So never underestimate the value of the work you're doing at the, mo uh, at the moment, the programs you're creating and the authentic change that you're engineering and the fact that you're inspiring this next generation. So uh, many thanks for the invitation to speak and good luck with your work. Thank you, Monty. I think you've put us all in a, in a positive can-do mood ready for our theme sessions. Today is about taking action. We can all do something. I'm doing the climate vision pledges at the moment and have found that once you have done something, it's easier to move on and do more. It's now completely normal for me to ride my electric bike to, to meetings at County Hall and in and around my electoral division. But it wasn't always second nature and I had to get used to planning ahead and allowing enough time and being prepared to get a little wet or a little hot from time to time. And of course, I know for businesses and organisations, it, it isn't as simple as buying an electric bike, but making a start is the key. And looking at what you can buy and how you use it to reduce the waste you produce or how your business business or organisation works to find where you might be able to make some changes. One of the sessions is for business and we will be looking at starting your business on a journey to net zero. This event is about climate action and all the theme sessions will be looking at where and how we can and must unlock Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly's potential. By unblocking the barriers that are preventing us all from being able to take action and to enable us to begin to change how we think and behave and do business. So now is the time for you to join us for the first of our two sessions. If you want to join the how we grow things and what we eat agricultural session, please stay right here. If you want to join the how we buy and use things, resources, circular economy, consumerism and waste session, please click on the link on the web pages below. I'll be joining the How We Grow Things and What We Eat session and Councillor Steve Watt will be joining the How We Buy and Use Things talk. So let's head off to our talks.